Welcome to the Oracle Coherence 12 CR2 or Coherence 1221 video series. Hi, I'm Brian Oliver. I'm an architect with the Oracle Coherence team. In this session, we'll be walking through the new foundations for the federated caching feature, a feature designed to further improve the continuous availability of your enterprise applications. The agenda for this session looks like the following. Firstly, we'll briefly discuss some of the existing high availability features of Oracle Coherence. Next, we'll look at some of the challenges developers face when architecting multi-data center enterprise applications and talk about the concept of federated caching in general. We'll then walk through a demo of federated caching in action. Next, we'll introduce the new federation, federated caching terminology here we'll learn how to use these new terms when discussing configuration, monitoring, and in fact working with federated caching events. So let's get started. Oracle Coherence has really been a pioneer in the continuous availability space for Java application data and, and processing in, for quite some time. Starting with the clustering technology and the interesting network stack called TCMP, Coherence really set the standard for sharing state and reliably executing processing of data in place for many, many years. It's done this on many levels. Firstly, the ability to do this across Java virtual machines in a single server. Have those individual Java virtual machines come and go without affecting the availability of the data or processing. Or doing that across Java virtual machines deployed across multiple servers. So not on a single server, but across multiple physically different servers. And then applying that concept to entire racks of servers, meaning that the new racks of servers or racks of servers can be decommissioned without any loss of data or processing. Ultimately, further extending that concept for sort of metropolitan style networks by enabling stretch clustering, having data managed and backed up across data centers within a metropolitan network. push replication, a coherence community effort to do geographically distributed application-based development. All of these things are actually quite crucial for both on-premise and, and off-premise or cloud environments, whereby the infrastructure and in fact the stability of that infrastructure and sometimes the availability may be unknown. In these spaces, coherence has played a very key part of enterprise application architecture. Coherence 12.2.1 introduces two new options in this space to further improve application availability, both within a data center and across geographic regions. They are cache persistence, the ability to support real-time active disk-based recovery and snapshotting, and the topic of today's talk, federated caching, the ability to support inter-data center asynchronous replication. It's easy to say that these features have existed in some form or another prior to this release. However, for Coherence 12 to 1, they've been completely redesigned and re-implemented from the ground up. They've been built into the core technology, right down to the network and clustering protocols, making them just work like other features in Coherence, both simply and with minimal overhead. In reality, it wasn't enough just to make these features work. We based our work on years of experience and essentially thousands of production deployments and field knowledge. And so our new designs have allowed us to pioneer in other areas like configuration and operational simplicity above and beyond just making the things work. We've solved some fundamentally challenging operational problems in this space. For example, what happens when a local disk persisting information fails, especially when we're not using shared storage? Or what happens when new cluster members are added or removed during replication? either to a disk system or to another site? What happens when a cluster member is shut down for maintenance? What happens when all of these things are happening at once? Is order of updates lost or is it maintained? Where would replication journals and disk storage be managed and, and kept so that we can scale out or scale back? And does the, si the system experience partial outage or can it continue operating? How does the system handle back pressure or slow networks or slow disk? And can these limits 
be placed on shared infrastructure, especially in a cloud, or defined in such a way that they're easy to manage and, and they're respected. These are just a few of the many challenges we've faced. And essentially we've solved m most of these, if not all of these operational challenges so that developers don't have to think, think about them. Furthermore, we've, we've solved them in such a manner that developers don't really need to do anything special. You know, there's never a requirement to, for example, repetition disk storage or repetition your application when you're scaling up or scaling down or adding a new cluster. There's no need to configure or run new gateway servers between clusters. There's no need to reconfigure the channels of communication if, if you're familiar with push replication. For federated caching, what we've achieved is, is actually quite, quite simple from the outside, but internally quite, quite complicated. We've managed to make the complex architectural challenge of multi-site replication as simple as possible. In fact, what we've designed as simple as running a partition cache in a system or cluster locally. So let's uh, dive into federated caching, the new technology that enables this. Before we get started, there are some challenges we have to acknowledge. Things that typically impact continuous availability and, in fact, maximum availability architectures. Put simply, enterprise class applications requiring continuous availability across data layers, across data centers, often have fundamentally different functional requirements that are, in fact, almost nothing to do with business logic. Some are simply to do with physics. For example, here are a few things that impact federated caching architectures or federated architectures. Latency. Long distances between data centers or clusters may mean application infrastructures must adopt an asynchronous model of communication to avoid local requests or local cluster operations paying the cost of this high latency. Whether it's actually due to long distances or in fact slow infrastructure, um, Application developers who are familiar with synchronous style operations, this change to an asynchronous style can actually be a challenge. Locality. Due to business rules themselves, um, applications deployed in different locations may have to own or be responsible for certain data. For example, in the London data center may have to manage or be the owner or in fact the system of record for the Londoners data. Whereas New York data center may have to manage the New Yorkers data. Uh, perhaps it's due to latency, but regardless, this introduces a new application requirement which hopefully can be solved through configuration. For example, each deployment may be able to see each other's data and hold and replicate in case of emergency, but they don't update the other's data directly, locally, in their own cluster. Similarly, there are rules about data retention, whether they're enforced through government or industry regulation, meaning that an application may only mainly retain certain data in certain data centers or regions. And closely related to this is the security of, certain, of this information, how particular information is filtered or, or it flows or in fact maybe obfuscated between data centers is, is quite important. Organizational structure itself may impact uh, all of this design as well. The impact of where a data center is operated geographically, perhaps for business or tax reasons, uh, is something that's often decided outside the you know, architects purview and these can significantly impact you know, the design and implementation of a, of a system. For example, distributed sites may often have very different business functions, um, sometimes based on the physical product capabilities or where a warehouse is located. And these things align with, often align with business continuity plans. And these are seemingly innocuous rules but can actually implement, uh, impact uh, application architecture. And ultimately what you want to try and avoid is having to build these rules as much as possible into your deep down code base, if you like. And lastly, you know, deploying an application into the cloud is essentially taking it into a globally distributed infrastructure. So using cloud can often expose you, your architecture to these types of challenges, whether you face them or not directly in, the, in your business that you operate. To this end, we really need a sufficiently configurable infrastructure to allow us to solve these sort of complex challenges in a simple and declarative manner. Something that we think you'll find Coherence capable of achieving with federated caching. So federated caching aims to solve these challenges and it allows applications to use caches, you know, basically distributed caches, um, as if they were local in the same cluster. So your application, if you're already using Coherence and using distributed caches, 
it should be trivial to switch over to use federated caches without any application change. Coherence itself provides the uh, background services to replicate and federate inf uh, information between the other deployments based on what we call topologies and rules. And uh, obviously each deployment, as we've mentioned, may be deployed in different geographies. But ultimately, all these things are designed to have min minimum application imp impact, especially for the developers and especially for operations. We want to allow applications that are already built using standard coherence APIs and, in fact, with Java 8, standard Java 8 APIs, to have the same semantics in a local machine, a local server, a local cluster, a, in fact, a local rack or a local data center, and have those changes applied across many data centers. So let's get started by actually having a, showing a simple demonstration. We can see we have 100,000 trades or 100,000 positions and their total value, which is being calculated using a co coherence aggregation function, or in fact, we're using a Java 8 stream request. We can see the server side elapsed time performing these uh, data collection activities and all these aggregations, of which there are about eight of them, and updating it, usually around every second. We can also see the distribution of these 100,000 trades, 100,000 positions, if you like, <coughs> across, uh, across the servers in our cluster. At the moment, there's just one server in our cluster, which is, in fact, serving our dashboard. Lastly, we can actually see the information about the servers running in our cluster and, in fact, the amount of memory that they're currently consuming. And you can see that this amount of memory changes quite frequently. Well, it's changing often due to uh, garbage collection and uh, garbage that we're creating while the application is running. It will occasionally bounce up and down, but generally it's fairly stable. So let's start by just adding a new server to our cluster. So this is something we've been able to do for 10, 12 years with Coherence. We add, add servers to our cluster, and when that's happening, what we see is that we can scale out. We're partitioning the data and sharing those partitions across now to servers, server one and server two. And they each basically get about half the amount of data. Server one in this case has a little more load because it's actually serving out the web content and managing a web request for us. And hence, it, it uses a little more memory. And in fact, this will come down over time. But interestingly, you can see that as we've added a new server, the amount of time it takes to perform our aggregations has actually halved. This is because this is a multi-core machine, in fact, a two-core machine. And what we're doing here is, as we've added a new server process, it's taken half the data, and now we can actually process it twice as fast, hence half the latency. Notice while this has happened, our positions and current value didn't change. You know, effectively, we've moved half our data on the fly and our application availability has stayed the same. We can see sometimes a slight increase in latency as uh, data is moved, but the fact, that it, the fact is our data is not lost and the availability of our data is still, still there. But, of course, this is a single cluster. This is just standard coherence behavior. This is not federated. <coughs> so let's start the federation by adding an entirely new cluster. So now we've requested our application, in fact, we requested the cluster to start a new cluster. And that's what it's now doing. So in the meantime, you can see now the federation state is changing. And we had a slight spike in our latency as we brought up an entirely new cluster and moved and federated all of our existing da data to the next cluster. Because we're not changing the data, the federation state is now idle. Let's go and look at our other, f other cluster dashboard. So as you can see, this cluster has only one server and it has 100,000 items. Of course, we can add a new server here as well. And this server is part of cluster B, it's independent of the servers in cluster A. So it has the same characteristics, the same behavior. Uh, we're not losing data as we're scaling out 
we can see the latency of operations on this cluster. In fact, we could, again, add another server. And you'll see that coherence progressively scales the data out across those servers. And of course, as mentioned before, you can see the latency jumps around a little bit as these new servers are brought online, but very quickly become stable. Now, interesting, let's perform some updates in this cluster. So let's just randomly update some of these prices, <coughs> or these randomly generated prices, um, and see what happens. And these are being updated across our, across our cluster. Let's go and go back to cluster A and see what's going on there. Because this is an active-active federation, we have <coughs> replication occurring in both directions between our clusters. You can see the effect of updates in cluster B on cluster A. And in fact, let's make sure that they're the same. So let's stop the updates in cluster B. Let's go back to cluster A. And you can see that the current values are identical. Similarly, we can start performing updates in cluster A as well and go back and see those updates coming into cluster B and so forth. We can perform them in, in multiple directions. And because we're using an eventual consistency model, we can see that the positions and the values become the same. Of course, we can do this while we're stopping and starting servers. So we can start updating values and start adding and removing servers from individual clusters while all of this is happening. So here we've added a new server to cluster A, we removed a server from cluster B, and yet we did not lose any data, and the data remained consistent between the two clusters. This is pretty powerful. In terms of building systems, <coughs> this allows us to very easily scale out, design a system that works for one cluster and add other clusters. Now, of course, we could, and in fact, we should shut down our federation. Let's see what happens when we bring it up again. So now we only have our cluster A. Let's, let's start cluster B again. Let's bring up our dashboard. And as for our demo, this is the second time we've started cluster B, and we decided we wouldn't send over all, the, all of the data this time. So cluster B is running. It has one member, but it has no data. What we'd really like to be able to do is tell Federation to send over all of the existing data. And we can do just that. And you can see now the Federation state says we are now sending data. And in fact, if the other cluster can't keep up, then it automatically throttles. And one reason why it may not keep up is because this cluster only ha has three servers. The other cluster only has one server. But <coughs> you can see after a very short period of time that the two clusters become in sync. Of course, there's a lot more things we can do. We can, for example, pause replication, update entries, restart replication, shut down clusters. And of course, with this demo, we can also use persistence. But let's today just focus on federated caching. Of course, seeing this demo raises just lots of questions. You'll probably have many. One, for example, is what's inside? How does this actually work? What about conflicts? And if you've used push replication, how does this relate to that? Well. Let's start with push replication. As mentioned previously, it's not actually push replication. It looks like it has the same capabilities and the same features, but in fact, this is a ground up rebuild and redesign. Um, we're not saying that push replication is in any way bad. In fact, it's very, very good. We know from field experience and work with customers that you can handle in, in excess of 6,000 updates a second across continental, continental US for five or more data centers simultaneously. But we also know from experience and, 
and in fact we also know through testing that we can have a better design and in fact we can replicate more we can have less overhead and and less configuration and less serialization and less memory utilization and uh, better network utilization um, and in fact very much simplified operations and that's what we try to achieve with ferrata caching and uh, as you'll soon see with uh, configuration and uh, monitoring management that this is what we've achieved Internally, federated caching is a special kind of partition, distributed cache, if you like, that in fact builds on top of a lot of existing technology that we have in place. For example, the message bus technology. We introduced in Coherence 12.1.2 um, to support high-performance InfiniBand networks and SDP and hardware-optimized hardware TCP. Um, internally, we use this for inter-cluster connection, which means you for federated caching, you could federate between racks in the same data center, say, for example, using InfiniBand, or in fact uh, across continents and you can do so with confidence. This is very mature networking technology that's used in very large systems. We also leverage Elastic Data, the technology we introduced in 1212 to support large-scale journaling of petition-based transactions. Um, we use this ourselves for managing um, journals of operations where we need to federate data between clusters. <coughs> so. Leveraging these two things, and in fact, as you'll see shortly, the live event framework, we can uh, integrate these things tightly and essentially replace concepts like push replication with things with something that's smaller, faster, and easier to use. Fundamentally speaking, federated caching operates very, very differently when compared to things like push replication. In fact, unlike push replications and, and in fact, other similar approaches in this field, coherence doesn't use a single gateway or what we call a distributor per cache. Federated caching actually uses an independent cache coordinator per destination, per partition, which means it scales horizontally, and as just as coherence does. So if you actually want to replicate faster, you simply add more servers, or in fact more partitions. Importantly, there's nothing much really to configure here because everything's done at the partition level, so there's no need to configure client connectivity. For example, you don't need to configure extend as you would with push replication. There's no requirement for this is federated caching has its own transport, its own protocol. And almost all of this is self-discovered. So enough of the cool marketing. Let's let's discuss some of the and uh, how we configure and talk about federated caching. And, and to do this, we really need a new set of terminology. Let's start with the simple things first. Really, a federated cache is a cache that permits uh, capture and replay of operations uh, performed against the cache, for example, across a federation. So we, we basically define federated cache very generically, and it could be essentially any cache. But in reality, a federated cache is really a distributed cache, distributes this partition of information across a single cluster, and it, we capture that information and journal it so we can later replay it in, uh, uh, across a federation. Well, what's a federation? Well, a federation is what we call a collection of one or more participants, or federated participants. What's a federated participant? Essentially, it's a service for managing data. And again, we define these things very generically. It's typically a collection of one or more servers, and it's often in the form of a cluster, and its purpose is to manage some data. So for us, uh, a federated participant is almost always a coherence cluster. But there's no reason that a federation participant couldn't be something else, for example, a database server. As we do these types of things with push replication, Federated caching is architected to allow us to federate information not just between coherence clusters but to other devices and databases and, and so on. Then there's the topology. And really topology is one of the key aspects. It's quite easy to talk about a federation which consists of a set of clusters, but topology defines the manner in which two or more of those participants or clusters within the federation are associated with each other. And, and we're talking about the rules with respect to the flow of information and how those operations are applied. And, and these things, this is what we call the topology. A federation actually can have many topologies. So you can have many clusters, and within, those, within that uh, federation, you can have different flows between those clusters. And in fact, each participant, each cluster, if you like, within a federation can be part of different topologies. So now let's look at some topologies. The classic one is active-active. We've all seen this before. It basically says that 
all the operations performed against a federated cache in a feder you know, one federated participant is sent to all of the other federated partic participants and, and vice versa. So this is exactly what happened in our demo. We had a cluster A and cluster B and active active and updates in A were sent to B and updates in B were sent to A. Um, often this is also called multi-master. The active passive uh, topologies, you know, as we've probably seen this before as well, all the operations performed against the active participants are sent to all of the passive participants. And typically you'd only have one active and one passive, but coherence will allow multiple actives and multiple passives. And in this it allows all of the actives to replicate between each other and down to the passives, and the passives just receive. But any operations performed against a passive is not sent back to the actives. The hub and spoke topology means that operations performed against the hub is then sent to all of the spoked. Really it's like a multi-way active passive. <coughs> and in this case, any of the operations performed against caches in the spokes are not actually sent back to the hub. The centra centralized topology is basically like a specialized hub and spoke. The difference here though is an update that occurs in the center is sent out to the leaves. Any updates and leaves is sent back to the center, which is then forwarded to the other leaves. Of course, these topologies may, may not be enough. Your organization may have other special topologies in mind. So to allow for this coherence federated caching, you can create custom topologies. In this case, we really base it on the roles of, of participants with respect to the flow of information. Basically, we either have senders, receivers, or repeaters. A sender will send the operations that occurred in it to the other participants. Receiver will basically just apply any information from a sender or a repeater locally, and that's it. Versus a repeater will actually apply operations received from other participants onto themselves and then forward them onwards. So what would this look like? <coughs> Imagine I have a, a New York cluster and a London cluster. And these two could actually be configured in such a way that they're active-active. So New York, in this case, would be a sender. But, and London would also be a sender. But we also have Sydney, whereas Sydney wants to be the receiver. And anything that happens in London, or in fact via New York, will also get sent down to Sydney. So in this case, we can change or define London to be a repeater, Sydney to be a receiver, New York just to be a sender. Effectively, when we, when we define custom topologies, we do this in, in what we call groups. And the nice thing about this is we can have different clusters in different groups and that they can overlap each other. This allows us to basically create any style, style of topologies. Ultimately, these things are building blocks and thus it's theoretically possible to construct any type of topology. In fact, all of the out-of-the-box topologies are internally implemented using these concepts alone. So armed with this information, let's look at how easy it is to configure federated caching, including these types of topologies. Configuration is pretty straightforward, uh, especially if you have compared it ever to push replication. And essentially, there are just two steps. Um, first is to define federated participants and the topologies. And this is done in the operational configuration files for coherence. Secondly, we need to configure the federated caches and associate them with the topologies. And as you'd expect, these are done in the cache configurations. So let's look at how to configure ActiveActive. So as we said, step one, we need to define using our new federated cache config element in our operational config, the participants. So we can say this is our federation and here are our participants. And for our participants, what we need to do is obviously we give them a name, but we also say where we can find them. And what this is, is basically one address of where, the, where they are in the world. One address of one of the cluster members. And of course, you could specify many if you like, but you only need to specify one to get it started. As more cluster members join, Coherence will automatically discover the new cluster members. And here, we're using the standard Coherence cluster port. One thing to note, we haven't had to define the topology at all. This is because out-of-the-box coherence assumes that when you start to define a federation that you mean active-active, which typically is the default. 
So all we have to do now is really change our uh, configuration to use the federated scheme and we're done. For active-active, we actually have to configure the, the topology. So as before, we would define our participants, but now we'd say, what are the topology definitions? And in this case, we can say active-passive, we can give it a name, and we can say which of the actives and which of the passives. And then in our cache configuration, we can specify, just as we did before, a federated scheme. And in this case, we're going to specify the topologies and we want to say this is the topology that this federated caching scheme is used in. Of course, caches can be overlapped with multiple topologies, and hence you can specify many topologies in here. So what, are the, what about the other topologies? Um, well, we've made this really easy for you as well. So in your operational config, now all you need to do is specify central replication if you'd like that, or in fact, if you want hub and spoke, you can do that as well. More importantly, if none of these really suit your needs, you can specify a custom topology. And as our previous diagram had shown, this is how we could specify our custom topology with New York as the sender, London as the repeater, London as the repeater, and then Sydney as the receiver. So that's all you need to know about topologies. What about events? <coughs> well, during the process of federation, certain events are raised so that applications and or monitoring management tools may intercept them and basically override their behavior in a bespoke manner. Such events include things like detecting when connections are made or lost, together with the ability to detect when connections are slow, like there's a backlog in replication, um, which may indicate that there's some network issues, or when connections return to normal again. These are events are important and allows applications and monitoring systems to understand and potentially control the volume of operations that are being performed against a federated cache. Additionally, these events can be used to capture when replication of operations is about to occur, and in fact, prior to operations being sent to a participant, and when they're about to be replayed in a participant. To support intercepting these events, federated caching leverages the live event framework, which was interest introduced in Coherence 12.1.2. And so let's talk about conflict resolution. Conflict resolution is a naturally occurring challenge in federated systems, especially when you're using an eventual consistency model. Put simply, all cache entries uh, were being updated simultaneously in two different places. So one of the stocks in one in cluster A were being updated at the same time as in cluster B. In this situation, both participants would attempt to replicate their mutual updates to one another, and this most likely would create a conflicting update. To resolve the situation, an application simply may intercept either the replication or the replay events, uh, detecting when an application level conflict occurs, correct that information and uh, either replay it or apply it locally. And the idea here is you can create a self-healing system uh, for conflicts and allows you to build very scalable eventual consistency models with self-healing built in. In situations where self-healing is not possible, you know, the process of interception may simply mark the cache entries as being in inconsistent and then allow a developer to, or, or user to report through aggregations, through streams, to resolve these conflicts at some later point in time. Defining a live event interceptor to handle cache events is really easy, you know, assuming you understand live events from Coherence 1212. Uh, uh, by the way, there's a video series on this as well. Um, in this example, we're writing a standard annotation-based interceptor for handling a federated change event um, by extending the abstract federated intercept. We're overriding the update method that's called for each change record, and, and these are generated as part of each partition-based transaction performed against a cache. In this case, when the entry key is greater than or equal to 50, we're actually going to reject, or effectively drop the change from being applied locally. So the nice thing here is we can receive the change record, which can include things like the local value, the previous local value, and if it's coming from another site, the values from the other site as well. This allows this one method to have all of the information necessary to make a decision as to what gets committed locally. There are many options for what you can do with change records, you know, accepting the value, rejecting the value, merging, creating new values, and so on. 
And the Java doc provides a lot of detail around the API, especially of these interfaces. Like other forms of caches and coherence, federated caching provides significant management and monitoring support via JMX. This includes cluster-wide control of the federation, for example, starting, stopping, pausing, replicating operations, just like that we used in our demo, together with bandwidth management and statistics for con flow control. For the most part, it should be hands-free, that's how it's designed, but in the just-in-case, coherence provides a lot of internal telemetry that may, may be useful for diagnostics purposes. Here's a quick overview of some of the JMX beans in the federated section. Additionally, we provided some enhancement to Coherence J Visual VM plugin. This allows very easy visualization of all kinds of statistics, including bandwidth. It also allows cluster-wide control of a federation. And here we've introduced the new federation, and you can see the recoverable persistent caching tab alongside it. It allows us to look at the state of the cluster, the throughput, the total bytes sent, received, what the backlog looks like, and so on. In this session, we looked at the new federated caching feature introduced in Coherence 1221. We demonstrated how federated caches are just like regular partition distributed caches, but with multi site replication capabilities. We introduced new terminology, including the concept of topologies and how to configure each of these new caches in existing applications. Finally, we introduced some of the new management and monitoring concepts, hopefully, highlighting the simplicity of design and its operation. We hope you found this session useful. Thank you for your time and we look forward to your feedback using Federated Caching.